Now, let's see how we do on time, Katie. Um, it is 126. Right 126? Now. Okay, uh, what I want to do now is I just want to leave you with a couple of things to think about. You know, uh, President Kennedy, this quote kept on running through my, my mind over the last few days. He said something like, some people ask why, I ask why not. If you have a visually impaired student in your classroom, ask yourself, why can't they do what I expect them to do? You can often come up with creative ways to solve some difficult problems. What you don't want to do is just say, oh, they can't see, so obviously they can't do whatever activity I assign. If you want them to complete a report, why not have them write it uh, in a computer file, a text file, and then just submit that instead of having to print it out. Then they could read it over and make sure everything is fine. Or maybe they could record it on an audio recorder and submit the report that way. Here's a really good example. When my wife was young, one of the things she had to do in PE is walk the balance beam. Now, I don't know about you, but I have enough trouble walking in a straight line on the floor, let alone on a balance beam. Now, it was a couple of feet off the floor, and I gotta admit, my wife is one of the bravest people I know, but she was afraid to do that. She did it, but she was really scared. Now, first of all, I seriously doubt, you know, the, the need for visually impaired people have to walk the plank, so to speak, but let's say that that is one of your requirements. Can you think of some way, ask yourself why not, can you think of some way that you could still have my wife do the assignment, but in a more humane, less frightening manner? What might you do with the balance beam? Hello, put it on the floor, that is correct so that then if they were to step off and fall, they wouldn't hurt themselves. Because of course, whatever the decisions we make, we want to make sure we never put our students in danger or anybody else in class in danger as well. So ask yourself, why can't they do this activity and try to come up with some creative solutions so that you expect the same from them as you do from the rest of their classmates. In today's society, it's getting harder and harder to get away with it. Well, he or she didn't do it because they were visually impaired. I ask the question, why not? May I, may I ask a question to you? Do you think blind people could be photographers? Yes. Uh-huh. Let me see if I can find this. Speaking of why not, <coughs> here's a book called uh, Seeing Beyond Sight, a collection of photos, this is a class project, take, all taken by visually impaired people. What they wanted to show the sighted world about their experiences. You might want to check that out before you leave today. You know what I like to do? And remember, now I'm legally blind. You know, one of my favorite things to do is to go out and use my telescope. And when I'm not scoping out the honeys in the sorority houses, <laughs> I like to turn the scope to the sky and look at the stars. But here is the problem. Traditionally, how do people use telescopes? They say, well, you have to point it at the North Star. Well, that's kind of faint, hard to see, right? Then you have to swing over to such and such a constellation like the Big Dipper and then look at the stars in the Big Dipper handle and then, then go about uh, three more degrees to the left and then up five degrees and you'll find that fuzzy little blob. <laughs> I can't do that. Let's face it. I can see the, some of the stuff, but I just can't. Remember the, my theme? Finding stuff, right? <laughs> so you know what they finally did? They came up with a telescope with a computer and a GPS receiver. And I want to show you what this thing does. I want to find the, uh, the video clip called Me. There you go. That's a scope very similar to mine. That's the hand controller. The guy turns the thing on. You know, he's not looking through.
through the scope now. He's just using the keypad. The telescope, thanks to its built-in computer and GPS receiver, is automatically, first of all, leveling itself. Imagine how much trouble I'd have doing that in the dark trying to read a carpenter's level. <laughs> then it's trying to find the relative position of magnetic north. Then it's trying to tip up to find uh, where the North Star ought to be approximately. And then what it's going to do eventually, it's going to say, okay, I'm pretty well lined up, but I still need a little tweaking. So what it does is it points to a region in the sky where there is a bright star. And it says, okay, Move the scope so the bright star is in the middle of the field of view. I can do that. Then it goes to one other bright star and it says, okay, out of all the stars that you see now, move so that the brightest one is in the middle. I can do that. Don't know what they are. Don't have to find them. Just center them. Two stars it finds for me. Then it's aligned. So what I would have to do then is just punch in what I want to see on the little hand box, like take me to Mars. And the thing will go doo, 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 doo. automatically. I don't have to find anything and it will automatically display Mars in the middle of the field of view. Isn't that wonderful? I am so excited about these computerized go-to telescopes. So, with all these options about reading and writing and leisure activities, why not? Why can't visually impaired people enjoy life as rich as their sighted counterparts? Now, before we wrap things up and turn you guys loose to play with some of this stuff, do you have any questions? Is there something you'd like to ask, either me particularly or a, something about visual impairment that you've been curious about? Don't be shy. And you don't have to raise your hand, obviously. <laughs> Oh, come on. I've been talking for an hour and a half. Dr. Franklin, please, I'm going to take that. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Lisa. You notice how I mentioned Canada there? I did. I told you. Yes. Uh, so this is about technologies, but um, in my class, we talk about technologies that are non-digital, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. You do things like teach about Rube Goldberg machines that are very hands-on, but gosh, if you knock over one of those dominoes when you're trying to see it mm -hmm. uh, with your hands, that's right. Problem. So how can I help my students? I've got one coming in that I'm going to be doing Rube Goldberg with. With the dominoes? The dominoes and any like contractions that are. Yeah, you know what I would try to do? My guess would be is to partition it off uh -huh. into little tasks and have, let's say, let's say you have a string of dominoes. Block them off, maybe. Put a, like a, a, some kind of a card or cardboard uh, partition. Uh huh. So she gets. Right. Them. So that even if they knock over a couple of them, stand those guys up again and then go to the next segmented area so that in case something bad does happen and they knock over some, break it up into little pieces like that. Try to segregate one piece from another until it's time to make the machine operational. Okay. That's what I would guess, yeah. Great, thanks. Good question. <laughs> yeah, come on, guys. How did you and your wife Ah, <laughs> that's one of my favorite stories. When we were undergrads here at ISU back in the 70s, 1976, I was sitting at my desk typing on my Smith Corona Galaxy typewriter, <laughs> and uh, I got a phone call, and this very attractive female voice, I love voices. I, I must admit that I make judgments about people based on their voices probably more than I should. You can tell me <laughs> And she said, I'm, I'm a ham radio operator. Do you know what that is, amateur radio? Yes. You get on the shortwave radio and you talk to other people around the world. It's great fun. It's not CB. You, you get a license and you, you, sometimes you put together your own radios and you, you talk and you make friends all over the world. Well, I was a ham radio operator and I was in the ISU ham club but everybody else lost interest and they left the club. So my wife calls and she says, is there a ham radio club on campus? And I said, yes, I'm it. <laughs> and, she, and she said, well, I'd like to learn how to become a ham radio operator because she visited her friend um, in uh, Minnesota over Christmas time and she noticed that she was a ham and she wanted to get in on the fun too. So she said, would wondered if I would teach her the Morse code and the theory and the radio regulations to pass the test. 
I said, sure, I'll do that. And then she said, but you know, I think I should tell you, I'm blind. And before I could stop myself, because I have a habit sometimes of blurting things out before thinking, I said, after she said, you know I'm blind, I said, that's great! <laughs> <laughs> so, she probably thought, what kind of a nutcase have I been? What I meant was, oh, there's somebody like me, this is so cool. So, um, between January of uh, 1976 and um, June of, uh, of, of 76, um, we, we, uh, we, we actually, what we did is we snuck into Stevenson Hall <laughs> in the evenings and went into a vacant classroom and I taught her the, the theory and the code and, and the regulations. And um, she took the test in June. I, I gave her the test. That was back then, you, the, the, that novice examination could be given by a, another ham radio operator. And um, uh, she passed legitimately, I might add, no, no help from me whatsoever. I wouldn't do that to her. I respect her too much. You, if you just give something to somebody, you strip them of the feeling of success. So she earned it like anybody else earned their ham license. And after she passed, you know, that was great. And I said, well, I'm gonna come up again, uh, come down in, uh, excuse me, in, uh, in July, and I have something I wanna ask him. So uh, I came up um, July 10th um, uh, to normal. I, I, lived, I used to live in a little town called Homewood. Uh, and uh, I, I asked her if she married me, and she said, yeah. <laughs> and uh, then in, uh, in May 15th of uh, 1977, we, uh, we tied the knot, and we've been very happily married now for, what would that be, about 36 years, yeah. Oh, wow, congrats. The woman is a saint, by the way. Anybody that can put up with me. I always hear, you're not lecturing, she keeps on telling, because I talk a little loud, because they used to be a high school teacher. You're not lecturing, she said. <laughs> but she understands me like, frankly, nobody else ever has. So I, God bless her, she's, she's the delight of my life. Any other questions? So what if you buy the love of your life for your 25th wedding anniversary? Oh yeah, well, you know, Dr. Fanzler, the way I look at it, nothing says I love you like a mass storage device. <laughs> she likes flash drives and, and big hard disks and things. So, so um, that's what I like to get her. And she really gets, you know, she's a geek at heart. And the thing is, she, she never knew she was a geek until she met me and she realized, you know, I kind of like this technology science stuff because I, I used to be a physics teacher. I'm really into the, the geek stuff, you know, the slide rule on the belt and the, the, <laughs> the handheld calculator and the whole nine yards, you know, and uh, she, I helped her channel her inner geek, so to speak, and now she's a geek too. So, um, yeah, she likes computer stuff for, uh, for presents. So, and the neat thing is I get to buy all these toys and I say they're for her, but frankly, <laughs> You know, I get to play with them as well. Okay. Can I, I have a question? Sure. Um, you showed us a lot of wonderful technologies. If one of these students ends up with a student with a visual impairment in their right. classroom, who do they contact about getting their hands on some of these technologies that might benefit their students? Okay, a couple of places. Number one, seek out the special ed teacher. Okay. They are often some of the most forgotten about professionals in the school. Oh, they take care of those other kids, not the, you know, not the regular kids, so to speak. I, I, after teaching high school, I don't know what a regular kid is anymore. <laughs> but, but to seek out the special ed teacher, they ought to know if you don't have access to one, talk to the school nurse, talk to the parents, you see, I don't care whether you remember that such and such is an opticon and such and such is a reader. I want you to know that these things are out there so then people can start looking things up on the web and doing searches like that. It's easy to find just about anything if you type in the right descriptors. Wonderful, thank Does that make sense? That's an excellent question.